Railway Conversations with Doc Frank. Hello and welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Doc Frank, and my guest today is Bill Whitmore, who currently lives and works in Tel Aviv, Israel. Bill has had a very colorful international career. He's been to many, many countries and he's got a lot of stories to tell. But what we are focusing on in this episode and also the next one, because this is a two-part conversation, a long-form conversation that I'm cutting into two parts, the focus of our conversation was really the impending rollout of CBTC on a new metro network in Tel Aviv, where Bill is working on. We talk about the necessity of a CBTC supply strategy. We discuss whether rolling stock and CBTC should come from the same supplier. How do you ensure that your technical solution is proven but not outdated? Where to go for interoperable CBTC? And much more. Please enjoy the first part of this conversation. Hi, it's Doc Frank again. What can I say? Even the best CBTC training in the world arguably can get even better. And that's what's happened with the brand new 2024 Understanding CBTC Fundamentals Training. This is an upgrade from the previous CBTC Kickstarter training that exists since 2014 and has been continuously refined, improved and updated. You have a massive 30 video lessons that you can watch on demand as long as you live. You've got lifelong access. You can build a certifiable CBTC competency and the certification is offered by me as well as an additional option. You do not need prior signaling knowledge for this training. Just imagine that you can learn the fundamentals of CBTC without needing to know anything about railway signaling before the training. So that really makes it suitable for anybody working in the railway industry and for anybody being interested in working in the railway industry. The training is topped up by an industry-leading Q&A support over at least 12 months. You can sign up for this fantastic training under docfranktraining.podia.com slash cbtc. I repeat that, docfranktraining.podia.com slash cbtc. And if you needed one additional argument, this course is actually cheaper than last year's training. So... That's my way of helping you fighting inflation. Hope you enjoy and I hope to see you at this CBTC training. Bill, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much, Frank. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure being here. Your profile on LinkedIn was so colorful that it really caught my attention. And then we, we got into a bit of uh, back and forth on one of my posts. And uh, so, so where are you at the moment? Oh, at the moment, I'm currently in Tel Aviv, Israel. Okay. It's a wonderful, wonderful new project that's just kicked off. Three new metro lines being designed from scratch. It is literally just kicked off. 15th of January was a kickoff day or what do they call it effective start date and it's just starting now i'm with one of the line managers what we would call the engineer one of the engineers client engineers for line m3 uh, three lines lines m1 m2 and m3 uh m3 as i said probably the most mature one <laughs> since since uh january the 15th <laughs> a few months um I'm with Artelia, a company called Artelia, French group. I've just joined them. I left Abu Dhabi. That's another another story. We can get into that. Uh, looking after M3 systems. I'm the systems design manager for Line M3 and also M2. Line M2 is populated by predominantly WSP folks, PB, WSP. Yeah. Uh, liaise with them. Um, line M1 is just literally kicked off about a month ago. So they're just populating with staff. 
I think it's majority Italian. I've just come across them a couple of times. They're just forming up. But obviously, I've got to set up meetings with M1. So the line managers, uh, the engineers, as we should say, are um, getting to know each other. How are we going to create? How are we going to deliver the network? And interestingly, Frank, interoperability. Really? <laughs> well, really? Oh, okay. I was I was just going to say that I mean if it's a brand new metro network I would assume that normally your choice of signaling technology would be CBTC communication based train control Yes absolutely there's okay. there's the client has done an awful lot of work an awful lot of work across the board civils uh rail systems MEP um for years now they've engaged Crossrail International Crossrail some guys in Crossrail <laughs> come across old colleagues as usual, as you do. Um, and they've also got Aegis aboard and a local company for civils and architecture. They've done a lot of good work, impressive documentation. They call them owners' policies, and they're, they're basically specifying what they want, requirements what they want, and how they want it delivered as well. There's a few things there that might be a little bit academic, mm. you know, you can see this is academic, not really born from experience. Um, but we're encouraged as line managers, we're encouraged to develop and embellish. In fact, that is the task to review the owner's policies, requirements, refine them, embellish them or reject them. So far, we haven't rejected anything, but we're embellishing things. For instance, my forte, I like testing and commissioning. Uh, may I just say, I, I know you're a uh, signaling heavy I started out British Rail as an apprentice in 1975 as a signaling apprentice, but I'm not a signaling heavy. That's my background. I'm more rail systems across the board, PSD, AFC, all the good stuff, engineering manager to bring it all together. So I have clever guys who work for me or you know, report to me or sometimes don't, contractors, whatever, but I don't claim to be a subject matter expert on anything. So, oh. <laughs> but at times... It's rather interesting. Sometimes I know more than the subject matter experts, which frightens the hell out of me. <laughs> well, yeah, traveling around. Well, one, one thing what I like about uh, metros and specifically the signaling for that, if it's CVTC, is that I find it to be quite commonsensical. Um, yes. With many of this of the uh, legacy signaling systems, like lights on sticks, uh, you have some signaling rules that were developed i don't know more than 100 years ago and then there were some adaptations to it like 75 years ago and then another one the, the latest revision was basically like 35 years ago and you probably won't find a living person that still knows how these old rules came about and what they actually mean so there's a lot of interpretation in there and and a lot of this stuff may have made a lot of sense back then when they when they came about but maybe not so much in the year 2024 especially if you want to run a, a high performance metro system so what i find intriguing about your current project this new metro in tel aviv is that it's a new metro system and it's using cbtc and it's in the very early stages of planning because at the moment, what you're doing right now is a verification of initial planning documents and then either decide to go along with them or to do something entirely different. So for me, that is still part of the planning stage. And this is actually where I think the groundwork is laid for a project to be quite successful or very yeah. unsuccessful, depending on what you're doing. Yeah, so there could be in the worst case, there could be some mistakes in those planning stages that basically set you up for failure, say, five years down the line um, that most people wouldn't even see coming if they haven't done uh, CBTC rollouts before or maybe some lessons learned what, what happened elsewhere. So, indeed, indeed. So, so one of the things that I like talking about in I'm doing CBTC trainings, I'm not sure whether you know, but that that's in fact my main job. The podcast is more a hobby on the side. Um, one of the things that I'm almost preaching about is the concept of a supply strategy for CBTC. 
that I'm basically saying that, especially at the beginning of the rollout, before you start the actual delivery work and you let the contracts, you need to think about the structure of your network. You need to think about uh, how many CBTC suppliers you think you you want or need. And uh, depending on the answer to that question, uh, you may want to shape your network in a in a certain way and you want to avoid to shape your network in some other ways because that might cause you interoperability problems. I mean, you did mention the word interoperability already. For CBTC, that normally means that uh, the wayside subsystems of certain suppliers will interoperate with the onboard subsystems that could come from other suppliers. Normally, if Wayside and Onboard coming from the same supplier delivered at the same point in time, you would think that logically the integration of that should be in the hand of the one supplier and that should normally work unless they are doing a really, a really poor job. But when those subsystems are supposed to come from different suppliers, then you will have a problem at the interfaces. And normally, what I would call the mainstream CBTC products of the most global signaling suppliers, the likes of Siemens, Alstom, uh, Hitachi, uh, previously Bombardi, Invensys, before they became part of the bigger companies, and Saldo, all of these CBTC products are by default non-interoperable. Really, yes, indeed. And that, of course, has consequences for your network strategy, and therefore um, you are now at the perfect point in time where you can look at, okay, what do we want here signaling wise and how do we need to structure our network in order to achieve this without getting into a pickle? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, Frank, you said you mentioned earlier about signaling principles evolving throughout the years. Many moons ago, I was at Neasden Depot for Metronet um, when they were getting ready for the new fleet of trains on Metronet. And I was actually responsible for the resignaling of uh, Neesden Depot. And one of the things that they didn't have there was anything written down on the signaling principles. Nothing yeah. written down. Yeah. And of course, nobody really knew why it was the way it was. So one of the I had to get one of the guys to literally work with Talis, who were the supplier at the time, to write the signaling principles from scratch and get them validated. Wow, what an experience that was. You mean you don't have it written down anywhere? <laughs> so that that was rather interesting to find out. But uh, yeah, it, it's fascinating. It really is. Getting back to Tel Aviv, I'm impressed. I, I really am impressed with the client here. Um, they've done an awful lot of groundwork. A lot of good base documents. I, I mean, really good. Um, nearly, but yeah, publishable quality nearly as good as Siemens, forgive me for saying that, but uh, I find Siemens documentation publishable quality, well, they used to be when I was working for them. And I I'm impressed. They've done a lot of good groundwork. Some is a little bit too academic for my liking. I mean, you can see it's academic. It's not some areas, not born from experience, but an awful lot of questions. Why should we go this way? Should we go that way? And impressively, very impressively, the client has said, we're naive when it comes to metros. We haven't got any help. You know, ask any question. And it, it's really good interaction with the client. I, I worked on JTMT, Jerusalem Metro, uh, sorry, Jerusalem Tram, oh, I don't know, what, 12 years ago? Maybe even longer, 15 years ago, when it was first introduced from Alstom. And I found the client down there. I learned more from the engineer there. Uh, unfortunately, one of the guys has died now, Yossi Sapir. Um, just from the hard talk, direct questions. Some people say Israelis are rude. Westerners typically come and they say Israelis are rude. I find it refreshing, Frank. Direct adult conversations. You know, I'm not a politician. I don't do politics well at all. <laughs> I get pissed off and, no, I'm not interested in that. Let's just do the engineering. Let's just do a good job. But the clients are here. They've admitted they're naive. Help. And then you throw a curve, somebody throws a curveball, and it's discussed in an adult fashion. You know, it's so refreshing. It's, they're my favorite clients, believe it or not. 
because they're so tough. You know, when I say tough, direct, great. <laughs> Let's have the conversation. Wonderful. Yeah. And yeah. I'm the sort of person, if I don't know, I say, I don't know, but I'll get back to you. You know, I'll find out. Others from West, mainly, well, I won't say which countries, can't deal with them. They can't, they can't just answer straight questions. They've got to bullshit. They've got to give a corporate answer. You know, we do this all around the world. And I've got to say, I, I, love, I love the engineers in Jerusalem. Where have you done this all around the world? Pardon? Where have you personally done this all around? Well, I'm with Alstom. We do this. No, no, no. The question was, where have you done this all around the world? Don't tell me we do this all around. Where have you done this all around the world? Oh, it's hilarious. I have found it so funny. But it cuts the bullshit out, you know? You know, just say, I don't know, but I'll get back to you. <laughs> anyway, yeah. sorry, I digress. No, no, that, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's really good. And, and I think uh, listeners that are working client side can probably take some important insights here that um, this, this straight talk and, and especially admitting when you're not the expert. I mean, it, it's, it's normally a catastrophe if a client organization think they are knowledgeable because they've read a few things on, I don't know, Wikipedia or watched a few YouTube videos or maybe listened to, to one consultant for like a couple of hours. Um, and, uh, and, and then they come up with uh, their interpretation of what they understood and the outcome is, is, uh, is really bad. So it's really much better to, to either take a little bit of a too humble stance Uh, saying, well, I'm an, I'm an absolute idiot when it comes to that, which is probably exaggerated, but, but it, it sort of sets the scene that they can ask for help, that they bring specialists or experts in from the outside. And, uh, especially if they, if they ask the same question to different people, they may end up with slightly different answers. And then they will say, okay, well, we've, we have an overlap here. We have a complete contradiction over there. Then they ask the, the direct questions i wouldn't even well some people call them tough questions but the only reason why they are tough is because they are direct you you yeah. you have it more difficult to wiggle around and and basically have some kind of 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 uh, fussy response which you can't be nailed down on so so on a direct question like this especially if it's repeated you Your, your best bet normally is to respond in a similar direct way. And be it just what you said, I don't know, but I will find out for you and then I get back to you and then I will have a direct straight answer. And it's very much how I work myself. Uh, but you're right in some cultural circuits, it's a bit, um, it's a bit complicated. It's a bit difficult. <laughs> Unmanageable. <at> <laughs> Unmanageable. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, As I say, I, I enjoy that environment. I've worked oh since since playing trains early on in 1975. I've worked in the States. I was with Siemens in the States, uh, Tren Obano. So that's going back 1990s. Um, I moved across to Bangkok after 9-11. I was laid off by Siemens USA, joined Siemens Thailand in 2002. Loved the MRTA, loved Thailand, loved Bangkok. Uh, went up to Taiwan, high-speed rail, was testing and commissioning manager there with the Japanese, TSC, Taiwan Shinkansen Corporation. Again, different culture, hey, to each his own. Didn't last very long there because I don't do politics very well. <laughs> um, went across to India, back with Siemens as a contractor, Delhi Line 3. Oh, where have I been since then? Dear, oh dear, Vietnam. Love Vietnam as well. I was there on line one with, um, oh, what were they called? Um, da -ba 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 -ba, the engineer. I can't remember. Japanese engineer. Didn't last very long there because I won't sign off anything that isn't 100%. You know, I, I'm pre Clapham and I'm post Clapham. And that inquiry, just when the guys were charged with manslaughter and they were let off, I mean, it just changed the characters. You know, it, for me, that's a watershed of our industry. You know, my training as a young lad was keep your hands in your pockets. If you touch anything, I break your fingers going into a, you know, a relay room. Um, that's, uh, you know, of course I had training as well, but um, compared to day systems assurance. Oh, well, thank you so much. You know, great, great. We don't write things on back of fag packets anymore or just red line markups, you know. So um, 
going around the world, India, uh, where else? Taiwan, geez, Doha. I was on Lucille LRT there. Oh, war stories about that. I was adjudicating fights between Alstom and QDVC internal. Doing most of my time was internal adjudications of arguments about scope and money. Uh, I've worked in Riyadh, lines four, five, six. Oh my, what an experience that is as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really, oh, really? <laughs> Never mind. Um, where else? Doha, Riyadh. Oh, and uh, then I went back to India. I, I worked on um, Kanpur, Metro there. Kanpur doesn't even cater for Indian tourists, let alone white boys like me. So <laughs> it was... Uh, it was an experience. I think the buggers even put spice in the water. It was terrible for me. I don't eat spice. My wife's Thai, but I can't handle spice. I'm not man enough for it. But the lads there found some great guys. Um, you know, there are a lot of Indians around the world, and CVs are good. But the experience, mm, really? Okay. But some of the guys in Kampur that were working for Ital Fair and uh, Tips are there are world class. I take them anywhere, really. I was so impressed. Of, yeah, wow, these guys are great. Yeah, I digress. I'm sorry, but it's uh, it's so nice to reflect on past places um, and different standards of acceptability. You know, of, of um, systems assurance and quality assurance and health and safety is just mind blowing. How it changes from country to country, and at times bloody frightening, really frightening. I had to kick off clients, directors, on the work site because they refused to wear their H, you know, their high vis vest, the PPE. Who are you to send us off the railway? It's my bloody site. I'm in charge of testing and commissioning here. You're not welcome. You don't have a permit. Out. You can't say that to me. I'm a director. Then, Mr. Director, you should know better. Out. It went down well with the CEO, but um, yeah, you got you just got to look after the boys out on the field. Anyway, sorry, Frank. Where were we? <laughs> and I well, a couple, a couple of things. But but I before because I come to that whole competency assessment thing, which I believe is one of your, of your site activities as well. Let let's just circle back to Tel Aviv before we forget about this. So, um, very often what I find when I start talking about the CBTC supply strategy, people look at me odd, like, uh, what are you talking about? So, so w what we could do, if that's of interest to you, is basically just play it through for uh, the Tel Aviv network and then see where that where that leads us. Yeah. Oh, sure, so, sure. so the first question would always be: uh, you, you know roughly what the scope of the of the rollout is. So you're talking about three metro lines. Maybe in the future it may become more, but for the time being there will be three lines. So you can talk about a network clearly. Uh, you want to roll out CBTC. So the first question, which to me is really a very defining question, is how many CBTC suppliers would you want to have for that network for these three lines? Is it one or is it more than one? Oh, no, a very good question, Frank. This is something that I'm involved with with our procurement guys now. Um, we got a good procurement guy from Britain. He's over, flies in. Um, <clears throat> the debate... The client doesn't want to be locked into one supplier. Paragraph, okay, period. Um, they're receptive, but they're also very, very cautious because I think they learned a lot of lessons from the LRT red line, which everybody knows. It's not, it's not a secret. Wasn't the best procurement strategy when it comes to uh, scope of works, interface, organizational, who's doing what, and all this sort of thing. And it was hard work. The product itself is good. It's literally outside my front door here. Every 10 minutes there's a tram running. It's run as a service, not as a business. Wow. You know, I mean, that's impressive. I love that. Anyway, so they've learned lessons from there. Do we want Chinese? Question mark. Quality? Question mark. Honestly, I mean, these are open, honest questions. I can't answer. I haven't played in China. Um I know I know they have interoperability specs, but do we want to open that door? I, I, I'm, ooh, I don't know, guys. Honestly, hold on, slow down a bit. The usual suspects, Siemens, Alstom, 
who, as you said, you know, they, they now own what Talis, uh, and Saldo and who else There's somebody else they bought recently, isn't there? But the big players certainly, but the question, Frank, for me is I've always seen great problems when a supplier of rolling stock is Mr. Supplier number A and the signaling CBTC signaling or, um, ETCS is from another supplier and offsite integration for me is just absolutely mandatory and the problems that arise typically the the potential problems that arise for the program schedule if they don't get on well so the question is do we want the same rolling stock manufacturer and and uh, cbtc system supplier you know mr siemens or mr alstom or mr blah 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 then that only limits it to what siemens alstom yeah or hitachi so there's three three big boys. I know CAF's in the mix. They they've got a product coming out, but it's unproven. You know, so these these yeah. are the questions that we're around at the moment. I I I personally think that uh, I I understand why people think that if you buy the trains and the the CBTC from the same suppliers, and unfortunately there are a few companies in the world that have both a uh, train portfolio including for metros and also a CBTC portfolio. Uh, you mentioned already a few names, the usual suspects. Um, but by by choosing train and signaling from the same company, you, you're introducing a constraint that may not be absolutely necessary. Well, what I found in my own personal practice working 20 years for the supply industry is that the integration between trains and signaling from the same company is not necessarily without its problems uh, predominantly due to company internal structures i mean in in every large company uh, rolling stock is one division signaling is another division how those two divisions get along internally <laughs> is, is another question even though on the outside towards the client they will always sell it as a as a major selling point that everything comes from one source integration will be not a problem at all uh, but but i've i've seen it before where uh, we were approached we being signaling supplier a were approached by a rolling stock supplier b for signaling equipment that could have been supplied by that company's own signaling department oh. They just didn't want to know about them. So, so, and, and I mean, that may be an exception, not the rule. I don't know, but, um, there are CBTC suppliers and, and Talis is one that comes to mind. They don't even have rolling stock, which means, but at the same time, they have one of the longest, if not the longest reference list of CBTC projects in the world. So that means each and every CBTC project they have ever done was with rolling stock from somebody else. So Indeed. integration and, and they basically make try to make this a selling point for their approach by saying integration on somebody else's train is our daily business. So that's not new to us. And over the years, we have worked with pretty much every rolling stock supplier under the sun. And, uh, and, and, that's, and that's what we can do. So, so I think there are arguments for both sides. But, but what I'm saying there there's an argument for having trains and CBTC from the same supplier, but it shouldn't constrain you in your procurement purchases where you basically rule out all the, all the other options. And, and this the, is not, not trying to promote Thales CBTC at all. This, uh, there are examples. If you look at London Crossrail, for example, the trains came from Bombardier, the CBTC came from Siemens. So, so you have integration. Um, with between different suppliers for train and CBTC quite often, yeah, and those projects get to work as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I've worked for the big boys, the, the usual suspects, as you say, in my time. And the hardest time that I've ever had as whatever department I've been in has been the liaison, the integration, as you say, potentially between signaling and rolling stock. We're rolling stock. We do it this way. Well, we're signaling. We do it this way. Commonality. And I always used to say, hey, guys, it's a contractual requirement. It's got to be done this way. <laughs> yeah. Which used to set people. I but mean, yeah, absolutely. The only thing I would say is yeah. the, the, the fear isn't the technology. 
it'll get sorted. Absolutely. You know, the interfaces always get sorted. It's the program. But over here at the moment, Frank, I think we've got a very generous timeline to get it right. So, you know, your your thoughts on Mr. Talis or a another. Yeah, why not? And again, the client is probing, is asking all these good questions. You know, it's yeah. so refreshing. Yeah. They're not close minded. Yeah. Not close minded. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, w one thing that has certainly something to be said about it is the use of proven technology. So, for example, if you were uh, keen to have a proven combination of train and CBTC, the question would be where has the supplier used that combination before? So, for example, a CBTC procurement activity could be which train manufacturers have you worked with before and and where has this been proven and uh, then you basically every supplier can come up with one or two uh, key reference projects apart from a much longer reference list they come up with one or two most relevant uh, projects that are really explained in much more detail and that gives you a limited list of references which you can go out and check. I mean, nobody would want to check five references for each and every potential supplier. But if you're down to, to two references, that may be manageable. Say you've got three tenders for CBTC with two references each. That would be six references, worst case, that you need to check. That seems doable. Yeah. Do you, do you know, Frank, on this particular job, at the moment, and I stress at the moment, that's not a requirement proven technology. And I, I whoa, pardon? You what? Really? First time in my life. Normally, what, three to five years, you know, proven technology? So that's a bit of an eye opener for me. It's okay, we're on dodgy ground here. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but, uh, yes. And, and, and it's extremely interesting and also a bit surprising that they are, I mean, not being religious about proven technology is one thing, but, but if you really want to avoid trouble, it's a good idea if the teething problems were sorted out somewhere else. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. one of, one of the problems that you often face there is the long period of time between the procurement and the actual delivery. So, so sometimes you've got, I don't know, seven, eight years in between. So by the time you're actually delivering what was promised at contract award may already be outdated or there may be newer version out there with better functionality, but you're still going with the old, with the old stuff. On the other hand, if you're going for leading edge and if you basically open up the doors for suppliers to use their latest and greatest version of, of CBTC software, you may end up with a better version where yeah, you yeah. are the first client where this version is, is tested. And then it doesn't really help you to say, oh, well, we are chosen the uh, globally most experienced CBTC suppliers, but the actual software you're getting for your project has never been tested anywhere else. Yeah. And you are literally the, the first one, the guinea pig, where all the uh, teething problems that you normally have with new software versions are all on your project. And mm -hmm. some clients didn't want that. Yeah. So, so in that regard, there was one, uh, there was one story where, which I thought was a very, very interesting approach. And that was here in Sydney for the Sydney Metro Northwest, which was the first CBTC in Australia. Um, what they did during the tender stage is they say, well, we are aware that we are, we are now for tender that was in, I don't know, 2013, something like that. And we expect the project to be delivered in 2019. And in those six years, a lot of stuff can happen. So we don't want a project, a product that was proven in 2000, before 2013 which often means 2008, 2009, 2010, something like that. So by the time Sydney Metro gets delivered, that stuff is at least 10 years old. What we want is a product which will be proven by the time that we're introducing it in Sydney. So they wanted every CBTC tenderer to come up with a, with a product version that would be commissioned a couple of years before Sydney Metro was due. 
And at Good the end point. of the day, they decided to go for uh, for Alstom as a CBTC supplier. And they wanted to have a carbon copy of the Alstom CBTC solution that they commissioned in 2017 in Hong Kong on the South Island line. And that was the reference product, which would then lead two years later to a, a copy application in Sydney where any teething problems were previously sorted out in Hong Kong and the guys in Hong Kong are normally quite good in sorting out teething problems. Yeah. Oh, Frank, this is this is gold dust. I mean, what you're saying now, what a what a good thought. What a good concept. Thank you. Good yeah. idea. Yeah. Fucking. And and that was yeah. the first time that I saw this because often you are really in that in that uh, in that pickle that if you want a well proven solution and in a government context well proven normally means at least three reference projects where exactly the same software version was used and if you really break this down uh, and you have like a tender process in 2024 it may well be <laughs> that the reference uh, the the product references you get are from 2021, 2018, and 2016. Old so stuff. that mean yeah. that means that this product and, and I mean it was commissioned the first time in 2016, which meant it was developed probably in 28 or something like that. So so yeah. that means you you're getting a, a product which is 16 years old, and in your product in your project you want to commission it in five years in the future. And then you have a product by that time, you've got a product which is 21 years old. Well, that's not the latest version anymore. That's nowhere near the latest version. And then and then people will come back to you and say, well, why why did you use this old crap? That's already more than than 20 years old. Well, because of that mechanism of, of procuring proven technology. Yeah, what a thought. I, really, that's an eye opener. That's a we could go back to puff and steam railway, huh? <laughs> well, leave the signals. <laughs> it, 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 it could, it could be, it could be. But, but at, at the same time, oh. and and I, I, I think that's another mistake that's often done during procurement. Uh, by the way, apart from planning, procurement is the second stage in a CBTC project where the most things can go wrong or can go right if you do it the right way then planning and procurement will basically set it up for for success if anything goes really? wrong there you set yourself up for failure without even knowing yeah unless you've got somebody coming from the outside for example like me where i said well i've seen this before somewhere else you're doing this today in five years you're going to have this problem yeah. and i know because i've seen it somewhere else so the so, so this is, this is one thing. And if you, if you just pick a supplier by their generic experience, by the list of references, you may still have a risk to end up with the better version of their latest and greatest product. And you are the first one, even though you thought by a choice of that supplier, you would buy in all their experience and proven technology and, and all this kind of stuff. So, so, so Absolutely. it's a balance where you really need to think about, okay, what, what do I want to achieve? And, um, how much is, where's the balance of proven technology versus aged technology or outdated technology in the extreme? Yeah. Yeah. No, thanks for that, Frank. That that's that's really thought provoking. Really, really good stuff. Thank you. Another thing that's cropped up, which I found amusing. Forgive me for saying this. <laughs> Interoperability for CBTC systems. What? You want what? Why? <laughs> we got a couple of cords, uh, single track cords joining each line. Line one to line two. Line one to line three. You know, one cord each. And I asked the question, why do we want interoperability if there's no through running of passenger services? You know, maybe get a rolling stock unit into a depot for heavy maintenance, blah, 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 somebody else's depot. And yellow plant. Yeah, okay, but does yellow plant need CBTC? This is going to be operating during engineering hours. Why do you want interoperability for such a limited traffic that would use it? And I haven't got a clear answer back yet. And I'm still struggling to understand why a colleague consultant in the 
um, client organization is really, really pushing this. I, I can't think of I can't think of why it would be required if there's no through passenger service and yellow plants going to be operating primarily uh, in engineering hours because the headway is 90 seconds and two minutes. You know, what? You're not going to throw a yellow plant thing during that time, surely. What's your thoughts on that? Interoperability and CBTC don't go together very well. And I've, I've written a couple of articles about that, and then I pointed them out to you previously before we had this this interview here. So, so I think you might have read them by now. And um, the there are only two instances at this point in time where interoperable CBTC can be found. So one example is the notorious application in New York City in the U.S. the uh, the New York City subway. Uh, they tried or they needed 25 years to make three suppliers interoperable. They, they, they got there. Uh, so they achieved their objective, but the New York solution is so bespoke for a number of reasons that it's, it wouldn't be transferable anywhere else. I asked a question earlier for a person in Australia when I did the planning here for CBTC. And, uh, and by all means, you can ask the question as well for, for Tel Aviv. The, the three suppliers, in case you want to know, are Siemens, Thales, and Mitsubishi from Japan. But definitely, uh, when I asked the question for Purse, I definitely got answers from Siemens and Thales, who both said there's no way in the world that they would transfer that new york solution anywhere oh, right, else because right. it's so, so bespoke a, and and uh i don't know interfaces with uh legacy relay interlockings that are unique to the us and, and stuff so there, there were a few things there which were so specific for new york that no other metro would want to use it so so mm. that's an option where the only thing you would have, the only option you would have for Tel Aviv is basically say, oh, yeah, we are now doing the same thing that New York started doing back in the year 1999. And we are OK if we take 25 years as well. And I don't think you, you are because I don't think you have the timelines for getting your project built. And And the thing is, in your case, New York was a resignaling. New York is a resignaling. So they had an existing signaling system, which was outdated, no longer good, but at least they had trains running every day. Whereas in Tel Aviv, if you don't have a signaling system in place, you can't run your trains. You have brand new metro lines. You can't operate them without the signaling system. So you can't afford a 25-year timeline. But Frank, are the usual suspects in the West, are they open to creating interoperability. It, is it in their interest? Do you think there's a will there for it to be done in the next five, ten years? I I don't think there is. I mean, what, what you need to understand there is that the New York network is huge in comparison to the three lines that you have in Tel Aviv. Um, what you what you often find in smaller size networks and and Purse is one of them. So we basically ended up with a with a rollout plan where we say the entire network will be done by a single supplier. Wow. So so what and and there are other examples as well which were uh, successful in the past and and pretty much every supplier has done one of those networks. So it's not. Uh, pushing the solution towards one certain supplier. So if you want an Alstom example, Amsterdam Metro would be one. If you wanted the Siemens example, um, Copenhagen s bahn in Denmark would be one, which is a suburban system, but it's using CBTC as well. And if you wanted the Hitachi uh, example, like the Ansaldo, which is now part of Hitachi, uh, Copenhagen Metro in Denmark would be an example where the entire network is fitted by uh, Ansaldo with their CBTC system, which today is part of Hitachi. So, so all the uh, mainstream suppliers have examples for that. Yes, it would mean that as a client organization, you get locked in with one supplier. But yeah, that's what that's realistically, what if you don't have an interoperable solution, you will be locked in in some shape or form anyway. 
So, so if I look at Sydney, for example, or if I look at uh, Singapore Metro, which is one of the brightest examples that you can find worldwide, they have different CBTC suppliers for each and every line. But for, for that respective line, there's a lock-in with that one supplier. That's not the end of the world. That's in fact quite normal with CBTC and you can, you can um, reduce the risk in your procurement process and we can talk about this as well in a moment if you like. Um, but forcing yourself to interoperability is really not a good idea except you go for the other existing solution for CBTC interoperability and that's the Chinese solution. And I'm saying Chinese solution because there's a number of suppliers in China with products that are compliant with the Chinese CBTC standards, which were written specifically with the aim of interoperability. So they have very uh, comprehensive interface specifications that allow for the development of interoperable interfaces between wayside and onboard subsystems. And they have proven CBTC interoperability in Beijing, that was a trial site, but also in Chongqing, where they have a network with several lines and a number of CBTC suppliers that all interoperate rolling stock with, with CBTC onboard on different suppliers' CBTC wayside. But you, you mentioned the question whether you want to go with a Chinese solution or not. Uh, I don't really personally think it's a big technology risk because if CBTC is good enough to run a metro in a major Chinese city, for example, in Beijing, then the technology should be good enough to run CBTC elsewhere. But, so so I, I, I don't really think it's a technology risk, but... There, there may be a risk with regards to um, understanding, like language barrier, for example, which, which I believe is probably still a, an issue. It's, it's getting smaller as an issue. It's getting smaller over time. But at the moment, that, that might be an issue. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make it bigger than it is to say, well, you can't really go that way. But it's, it's a consideration that the client organization would have to make probably in exchange with Chinese suppliers. And, and normally everybody's tried to put their best put, uh, foot forward in a bid process, in a tender process. So if you can't understand what they're saying in a tender situation, what are the chances you will understand the engineers during project delivery? Yeah, And, and, and some clients may say, well, we, we don't really want to bear that risk. Frank, what's your thoughts then? The Chinese interoperability solution sounds, hey, that's good. I mean, really, that's that, that, that's dreamland. Would the usual suspects in the West, would they, do you think, in five years' time or anything, that their kit will be using these standards? This, the this is... This is a super interesting question. So, so my, my previous articles were basically investigating what are the options. Yeah. So what, what are the options, especially the second article, which I wrote in uh, or published in February last year, 2023, uh, was about what are the different possibilities for the Western CBTC industry, Western meaning North American, European, and, and so on to achieve uh, interoperability and are they interested in the first place? You raised the question already. And uh, wh what I basically came up with was that the most practical solution would be to adopt the Chinese existing interoperable standards. Hi, this is Doc Frank again. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Please make sure that you don't miss the second part of it, which is the next version of the podcast number 68. If you want to make sure that you don't miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the show. Thank you. Hi, this is Doc Frank again. Before you head off, I just wanted to let you know again of the arguably best CBTC conference that has ever been held the CBTC World Summit 2023, with 18 speakers from 13 different countries. It was a mega event in September this year, 
and you now have access to the official recording where you can see all the presentations all the question and answers after the presentations and even the vip fireside chats that were exclusively for vip attendees during the conference but you can have all of this now lifelong on demand you can watch it whenever you want from wherever you want and how often you want don't miss this opportunity and sign up to the best cbtc conference ever on docfranktraining.podia.com slash cbtc world summit 2023 i repeat that docfranktraining.podia.com slash cbtc world summit 2023 if you want one recommendation from me on cbtc that is it the best content of the year by a mile don't miss it hi it's doc frank again i hope you liked today's episode i like to keep it as simple as possible so i only have one single request for you if you like this podcast please tell your friends and colleagues about it that's all i want because that's a service that i'm providing to the industry and i would like as many people as possible to listen to this podcast and learn something from it so please share and until next time Keep it simple and bye for now. Thank you for listening.